Welcome to the fourth video of Myositis 101. Today, we will discuss about some of the environmental triggers for myositis. Remember last week, we discussed some of the genetic risk factors for developing myositis. We also discussed that we need both the genes causing myositis as well as environmental trigger to cause myositis. So we'll focus today on what are some environmental factors that can lead to myositis. The risk factor of myositis or the triggers for myositis are broadly divided into infection and non-infection risk. So let's first talk about infection risk. Amongst the infection risk, there are a variety of infection, including viruses, bacterial infection, fungal infection, that has been linked with the development of myositis. However, none of them are proven or consistent. By consistent, I mean some studies show one thing, the other studies show something else. And these associations are also not strong. Because of this, currently there is no single infection that is considered as a potential to cause myositis or as a risk for development of myositis. Now, with that being said, many of my patients report having viral infection or some other infection before they develop their first symptom of myositis, whether it's they developed a rash after, right after the infection or they notice muscle weakness after infection. Now, that might be true. However, it does not necessarily mean that the infection led to the trigger of myositis because in many cases, the viral infection might just bring the patient's symptoms too much more notice means patient may have very mild myositis to begin with and that infection led to clear indication of patient having muscle weakness or a rash or arthritis and so on. And in other cases, it could be that the infection led to an overall generalized uh, activation of immune system and that activation of immune system led to the myositis being blossoming and, and uh, coming to forefront and that led to the patient uh, seek medical care. And it may be true in some cases that viral infection actually did trigger, truly triggered the myositis, which wasn't triggered before, wasn't present before. However, our problem is we currently don't know any consistent viral infection or virus that actually does that. So the studies are going on and we hope we'll find someday uh, the actual viral or bacterial or other infections trigger, trigger for our myositis, but currently we don't have that information. Next, let's discuss what are some non-infectious trigger, general environmental triggers of causing myositis. Now, there have been many environmental triggers such as dust, toxins, gases, drugs that have been implicated or thought to trigger myositis, but none has been proven except for clear risk of developing myositis. And we will discuss each one of these risks one by one. The first and the foremost risk I want to talk to you about is ultraviolet radiation. Yes, UV light that we get from sun. Now, we know that when we get UV light exposure for prolonged periods, certain genes in our body get activated and those genes may actually alter the immune system and that may eventually lead to many different autoimmune disease, but definitely myositis. This association of UV light is much more strong for dermatomyositis as compared to some other forms of myositis. Now, how do we know that? We know that because when we look at the studies, many studies have implicated that as we go from north, where there is less sunlight or less direct UV radiation, to south towards the equator, the frequency, the prevalence, the incidence of dermatomyositis specifically increases. It also affects other forms of myositis, but much more stronger associations have been seen with dermatomyositis. Now, does that mean if we are a normal healthy person, we should avoid uh, UV radiation or direct exposure of sunlight for a prolonged period of time? Not necessarily. One, the risk overall is very low. That means many, many, many patients uh, receive prolonged uh, sunlight exposure and very, very rarely may develop myositis. So that's number one. But more importantly, if we use basic precautions against UV light, 
uh, various basic precautions would include uh, using the sunscreen or uh, wearing the hat or uh, long sleeves and so on may actually protect you from sunlight and prevent the development of dermatomyositis specifically. But also if you have dermatomyositis, again, you may want to avoid prolonged exposure to sunlight or UV light. Again, using basic precautions go a long way. The second risk factor I want to talk to you about is smoking, especially in patients with JO1 antibody or anti-synthetase syndrome patients, especially if patients who develop interstitial lung disease associated with myositis. Smoking has been seen to be associated strongly with the patients with JO1 antibody and overall all antisynthetase syndrome. Now, we know that smoking leads to various other autoimmune diseases as well, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. So its association with myositis is not, not surprising, as, I, as we have discussed before, that autoimmunity tends to go together. If you have a one autoimmune disease, you may be at a risk of developing another autoimmune disease or your family member may be at a risk of developing another autoimmune disease. And smoking is a strong risk factor for many different autoimmune diseases, including myositis. The third risk we will talk about is statin. Yes, the cholesterol lowering medication statin that many of you may already be on. These are medications such as simvastatin or lovastatin and so on. Now, I'm not suggesting that patients should or people should stop using statin or people who are on statin should stop statin because they have a fear of developing myositis. That's not the case. In fact, statin saves life. People should get onto statin and make sure their cholesterol is under control because it's very, very rare that statin may lead to myositis. But at least we need to discuss that it is one of the risk factors. So if you are on statin and develop muscle weakness or other muscle symptom, then you need to alert your doctor, could I be developing myositis? And then doctor can do further testing to see if that could be the case. Now, if and when people develop myositis from statin, which is very rarely though, it can be in two different forms. One is the form what we call as self-limiting disease. We typically call as statin-associated myositis or statin myopathy. Now, this is a form of myositis which is slightly more common. About 1-2% to of all patients taking statin may develop this. And when they develop this, their doctor simply stops their statin and these patients continue to improve in subsequent weeks to months. And generally they get better by few months, they get to their normal uh, baseline. Now these patients may develop some muscle weakness, muscle pain, or a mixture of muscle weakness and pain uh, along with elevation of muscle enzyme. The second form of myositis that can happen after taking statin is much more rare than this more common form of statin myopathy, which by the way itself is not that common. The second form is called autoimmune necrotizing myopathy or immune mediated, necro, uh, immune mediated necrotizing myopathy or simply sometimes we call it as necrotizing myositis or necrotizing myopathy. Now this particular type of myopathy or myositis is an autoimmune disease. So even after stopping statin in these conditions, patients continue to have muscle weakness and muscle enzyme elevation and or muscle pain, and they may not improve unless they seek a care of a rheumatologist, neurologist, or dermatologist who would then put these patients on immune suppressive medication leading to further improvement or a drug called immunoglobulins or IVIG could be given in this condition, which may lead to improvement in some of these patients because this is a more autoimmune form. So even though the trigger of the autoimmune myositis was statin, but once it's triggered, it's an autoimmune disease of its own and will not get better by simply stopping statin. You need to treat it. Now, the last but not the least trigger I want to talk about is cancer. Cancer has been strongly associated with both forms of myositis, dermatomyositis and polymyositis uh, for decades. We know this association going back since 1990s. In fact, in dermatomyositis, 
the risk of cancer could be as high as 10 to 30 percent. And in polymyositis, the risk could be as high as 5 to 15 percent of these patients may have associated cancer. We believe what happens is that there are cancer cells that comes in any person. These cancer cells are then fought by the immune system to suppress or eliminate these cancer cells. In many cases, when patients develop cancer, the immune system has failed to overcome or destroy these so-called cancer cells, leading to full-blown cancer. But in some of those cases, what happens is this activated immune system, which was supposed to act and failed against cancer, actually turns against its own muscle and skin, leading to dermatomyositis and polymyositis. In the end, I want to talk to you about two other risks that everybody asks me about. One of them is dietary risk factors. Typically, we tell them that there is no particular diet or a food product that can lead to development of myositis. With a rare exception that certain food products such as oyster mushroom or red yeast rice extract may actually have naturally occurring statins called lovastatin. And if patients have taken, people have taken these food products and they have the right gene and the right uh, environment, that may trigger that statin-induced autoimmune myopathy and may develop muscle weakness. Now, most people who take oyster mushroom or who take red yeast rice extract do not develop myositis. The second loose association I want to talk to you about is association of seasons with development of myositis. It has been studied and shown that certain seasons may give you a higher risk of developing certain type of myositis. Again, I want to make it clear that all types of different myositis could happen in any particular season. It's just that the frequency of certain types of myositis is higher in one season and other type of myositis might be higher in other season. With that, I want to thank you for listening and we will discuss next week uh, how a doctor can make an accurate diagnosis of myositis. So when patients present with different symptoms of myositis, what type of test or evaluation um, a doctor can do to reach an accurate diagnosis and start treating our patients. Thank you very much.